Hey, so good morning, uh, you silly bastards on a beautiful hillside composed of mid-Cretaceous limestone. That is roughly 100 million year old limestone. Uh, the limey mud, the lithified limey mud of an ancient seafloor. Uh, we have uh, not only the uh, brutal and uh, somewhat terrifying agave lechugia, which is, uh, you know, the shindagra agave. Not so nice to get stuck in your feet. Uh, that's why you got to wear the hard-soled shoes nice. But we also have the lovely Coryphantha echinus. You can know beneath those radial spines and the central spines, you can see those tubercles. Now, when you're looking at cacti in the off season and they're not blooming, you got to pay attention to two distinct features. Actually, there's a couple, okay? Not only just shape of the stem, because the cacti it technically is just the stem and the leaves are the spines, or the, excuse me, the spines are the leaves, they're the modified leaves. Okay, you got to pay attention to the shape of that stem. In this case, it's somewhat globose. You got those tubercles, those little nipple looking things uh, topped by the areoles, which the spines are coming out of. You also have central spines and radial spines. You can see this has uh, how many central spines we got? Well, the central spines are the straight, the straight ones that just project out. Well, they're all straight, but the darker ones that project out. You know, to give it uh, some altitude. And then the radial ones, of course, well, they just radiate around the aerial. You could see those little white bastards down there. Let's see if we could zoom in give you a nice money shot over there. See, you got many more radial spines than you do central spines. Those can be diagnostic features when you're looking at cacti. Because let's face it, a lot of them do uh, look all the same. Uh, especially when they're not flowering. And they can be very confusing. Anyway, that's Coryphantha echinus. Coryphantha is a pretty big genus in the American Southwest. Many of them have those tubercles. Uh, some of them can look quite like Mammillaria, which is another uh, enormous uh, clusterfuck of a genus uh, in uh, Mexico and the American Southwest. And there you go. There's more of that agave lechuguia. Now, you'll see those little, uh, almost looking like some something you'd see on the bottom of the ocean floor, those weird little uh, stringy ferns. That's a species in the genus Astrolepis. Astrolepis is a desert fern. It's a xeric fern. Uh, in a, in a, the family Pteridaceae. Wonderful family. Uh, Pteridaceae is noted for having the recurved margins on those tiny leaflets. Here's another one of those Astrolepis. Now Astrolepis, like I said, uh, is, a, is a pretty wonderful genus. This is Cochisensis. You also got Astrolepis sinuata, Astrolepis syntagerima. You got quite a few of them. They're all pretty gorgeous and they all utilize, well this is kind of, this is the off season so you can't really tell. It's better when they're green and active, not dormant. But they got uh, basically scales, trichomes and scales on their, oh look at a lichen. Look at a ground lichen. Looks like uh, maybe some kind of cyanobacteria mixing with a fungus or I guess it could be, a, could be an alga too. I'm not a lichen expert, I wouldn't know. Anyway, they got the scales and the trichomes on their leaves, you can see their leaves the little leaflets are recurved right now, but if they weren't, if they were out in photosynthesizing and flat, well, you can still see the trichomes and the scales. It's basically just the fuzz. Do you like fuzzy shit, huh? Doesn't it make you feel better when you're getting kicked in the in the face by life? Anyway, there's that Coryphantha again. It looks like some rabbit was dining here. And uh, right over there, you got that uh, kind of serious any acanthus. Okay, looking up at those beautiful hills, you can see all these spikes, these basically woody spikes sticking up everywhere. That's a plant in the genus Desilirion. This is Desilirion taxanum, and, uh, well, the taxonomy is a complete fucking mess. It's either Asparagaceae, the asparagus family, which agave is also in, or it's in its own, uh, its own family in the larger Asparagales orders, which is the same family Nolina is in, which I believe was Ruscaceae. But there's always some bored PhD student fucking the janitor around, swapping around, you know. It gets really confusing. But uh, either way, the point the point you want to make is it's related to Joshua trees and, you know, other yuccas and agaves and all that. And uh, it's just, it's a huge family of monocots. Which again, just remembers, remember that means one leaf, not two seed leaves. Well, generally. But uh, it's a whole separate clad of flowering plants. Anyway, that's Illyrian. It's pretty great. You like common name for it, so tall. You could take those. Well, this one's kind of crooked, but if you get one of those like that up there, that looks like a good, good, uh, you know, a good uh, tool to cane somebody with. You know, you can make it into a walking stick, but you could also use it to cane somebody. You and your friends could beat each other with them. Multiple different uses for these things. It's just a basically a nice woody 
a stock. It's like a nice woody stock, kind of like an agave. But I do suggest you smack somebody with it. Could be real nice. That's Illyrian. Notice the uh, on the margins, those spines, okay? That can be a diagnostic factor for the different species too, is which way those spines are facing. And now you might remember me mentioning at the beginning of this video, nice, that uh, this uh, this rock right here is basically a lithified calcium carbonate, the remnants of an ancient sea, basically a hundred million year old sea, uh, which uh, is uh, undoubtable once you start seeing uh, these fossils everywhere. You see these uh, basically brachiopod and clam fossils. This might actually not be a, a brachiopod. I'm not sure, but either way, uh, these fossils are everywhere in this material. So it was an inland sea. Uh, it was a relatively shallow sea, uh, you know, during the Jurassic. Would have, would have just loved to see what was going on on the land, but I'll take the oceans too. Remember back then, uh, the ammonites were still alive. You know, those, they basically look like an octopus with a, with a twirled shell, you know, with a spiral shell. They were a cephalopod. They finally got taken out in the KT extinction. You know, when that comet uh, slammed into the Yucatan about 66 million years ago. Thanks, Wally Alvarez. And, uh, you know, you, you see these, you see these everywhere. I mean, you, oh, but the other thing I want to show you too is you get these weird, uh, looks like a chert deposit. It, it's conchoidally fracturing. And even, uh, you know, in this particular canyon, you'll find some, uh, Oh, look at those. Anyway, in this particular canyon, you'll find some of these chert deposits that have quite obviously uh, been worked by uh, by the ancient peoples, you know? By, uh, not sure what tribe. Like, here's a good example. Look on the margins of it. You can certainly see uh, somebody uh, has been uh, chipping on it. And it probably wasn't the javelina. You could see just working it. Probably, it'd be a nice tool, too. A nice scraper tool for scraping a meat and a sinew off the bones and what the shit. There you go, nice species of ephedra in the uh, Nitalis, you know? Very, very, very interesting lineage. Same uh, same branch of the tree of life as well, which uh, some of the other weird best. Anyway, ephedra is the trucker speed plant. Make a tea out of it, it gets you ripped. Maybe not in a good way. Might give you panic attacks, huh? It's pretty, I, had, I made tea out of this once and it was no replacement for coffee. It just, it felt like low grade speed and it wasn't pleasant. We got a nice plant right here. This got beautiful bark on this guy. Texas persimmon, Diasporos texane. Look at those leaves, kind of fuzzy. No petio, they're sessile. Looks like a lot of, uh, looks like a lot of other, st other stuff in South Texas. Uh, margins are recurved. I think that might just be because it's dry and cold. It's a dormant season. They all do that. See, they all got the margins recurved like that. But look at that bark. Do you see that? But look, it's so smooth and nice. Real beautiful bark. Fruit is a little black, uh, looks like a grape. You know, the persimmon family though, they're in Ebenaceae, Diasporos Texana. The Texas persimmon. You see them, you see them in some really rough areas. I mean, again, I was here late August, it was 110 degrees. I had to just pull over and sit in the shade because it was just too, it was fucking brutal, you know? Me and the dog were dying. You know, it was bad for his anxiety. You got to take him to the shrink. You know, he's got real anxiety. This sort of starts. And when he's, you know, the thing about him, okay, is when he gets anxious, he gets mean. He gets, he gets abusive. He starts berating me, cussing me out. I don't got to take that. You know, I don't need to take that over there. I don't know why. I don't know why I put up with that. You know. Okay, there we go. Another nondescript spiny shrub. Some spiny bullshit in the desert in West Texas. Big surprise. But, uh, you know, you look at it, you kind of wonder what it could be. Uh, it's got the sessile leaves. Too much stuff has sessile leaves that is no petiole, just emerging out of a fascicle. You know, kind of a pain in the ass. You see it, and it's just one big meh. Of course, it's a dormant season off. You could see it going off, it'd be pretty nice. This is in the Ramnaceae family. Other thing it could possibly be that has uh, branches that it kind of turns into spines like this is a species in the genus Castilla, the crucifixion thorn family, but it's not that. Especially when you get a look at some of those fruits. Oh, I just knocked them off. There's one. You can see very obvious uh, buckthorn family fruits. Little berry. It's all dried and shit. I just knocked the other one off because I'm a jackass, but there you go. Anyway, this is Condalia. There you go. Remember, a lot of, a lot of stuff in that buckthorn family, multiple different species uh, Zizyphus, Condalia, uh, Karwinski, and now it's Ram, Ramnaceae, now it's Ramnus, 
but a lot of stuff in their family turns its uh, its terminal shoots into spines. So that's how it does that. It just turns its branches into spines. Pretty nice. Again, a lot of success in his family in the deserts. Ramnesi has been very successful in the Zeric areas. Over here you got a nice guayacum. Creosote family. Zygophilaceae. Looks uh looks get get get, get the pinnate the, the pinnate leaflets almost looking like a fabid, but they're a little too close, almost looks kinda shaggy. Then they fold up when it's dormant, of course. Then looking over here, the, what looks like a shag carpeting in the desert, it's actually a species of plant. This is in the genus Selaginella, notable for having the ability to completely dry out, but then once it gets just a littlest bit of moisture, the littlest bit of rain, or even a thick fog, just comes back to life, starts photosynthesizing. Pretty incredible plant, you know? And it makes sense uh, that it's, uh, you know, so ab able to do this. You know, it makes sense. The lineage goes back almost, you know, 350 million years. I mean, fuck, it's been around for a while. It's been through a lot. It's been through the evolutionary filter, uh, as you could say. Well, here we go. Here's a nice one. Pretty common one, too. Just hiding out. Here we go. Echinocactus horizontalonius. Horizontalonius monk. Beautiful plant. Loves the limestone. Won't grow in anything but limestone. You get it primarily in a Texas and New Mexico, as well as a Coahuila and Chihuahua in a northern Mexico. And then you get a couple of disjunct populations of a rare subspecies, that subspecies Nicolzii in Arizona. But since uh, southern Arizona is mostly volcanics, there's only a couple patches of limestone, those populations have been isolated because this plant can't really grow on volcanics. It needs that nice volcanic, or the, excuse me, a nice limestone substrate, that nice calcareous substrate. So this one's kind of hiding out, but uh, I've seen some big ones around you see little ones everywhere too but uh yeah gorgeous plant but you know it likes it it's got it needs very specific conditions to be happy among them is limestone and again it can take those brutal uh that brutal heat in the summer as well look how blue it is see how blue when they're flowering when they're going off absolutely gorgeous got numerous ribs got about 10 ribs on there can have more and then of course just those uh spines those radial spines that kind of bend back you got any central spines on there? Not that I see right now. Oh yeah, there you go. Nice, uh, nice uh, berberis. Look how blue it is. Very blue in uh, sp spinescent leaves. Super blue. And it's of course it related to Oregon grape. It's in the Berberidaceae family. Got those a uh, lot of interesting compounds in those roots. Don't use them unless you need them, though. Of course, don't don't be getting all witch and trying to you know make frivolous potions and with this shit like a lot of these goofballs. All right, the compounds are berberin and yellow compound it displays antimicrobial activity there you go species of berbers a lot of these are ubiquitous in deserts again uh, they avoid they deal with the heat by that uh, that uh, thick wax on the leaves as well as that glab uh, glabrous and glaucous blue color anyway so speaking of those uh, those little chert pieces you can see where they're weathering out of the limestone right here see them just embedded right there in the limestone so uh, you know one could guess how they formed they could be uh, you know, deposits, basically precipitate deposits, water moving through that rock, dropping little bits of silicon with the shit off. Uh, who really knows? Up there, you got a nice member of the sumac and poison oak family. It's uh, Rus virens, it looks like. Very pretty foliage. Not allergenic either. You could touch that all you want. You could rub it in your crotch, put it in your ass. Don't matter. You're not going to break out, you know? I don't know why I got to bring it there. Hopefully, you have no children watching. Anyway... Here we got a pretty interesting plant. We got a couple interesting plants, actually. I'm going to have to cover them with the shade because the sun is behind me and it's glaring. Here you have a uh, species of pyridoli, probably angustifolia. Pyridolies are the rock daisies, of course. That is, 95% of the species in a genus only grow out of vertical rock escarpments, much like you have right here. Very interesting ecology. They're fucking wild. They've experienced a massive radiation over the American Southwest on down into Mexico. And... Uh, you know, they got a fitting name, rock daisies. Over here you got, this is a species of penstemon, penstemon baccarifolius, because I guess somebody thought it looked like baccarus. I guess it does a little bit, but whatever. There's a distinctive uh, capsules and penstemon with those little tapering tassels at the end of, uh, you know, at the end of the, the uh, fruit right there. So no seeds, unfortunately. Red flower when they're going off. Red zygomorphic flower. Beautiful. Almost killed myself trying to take a picture of one uh, near, uh, where the shit was that? I think it was near Seminole Canyon. But uh, 
Over there you got that Echino series, sunny acanthus. Oh, and then this guy right here, a relative of poinsettias in the genus Euphorbia. Probably my favorite Texas Euphorbia. This is Euphorbia antisyphilitica. Looks a lot like that ephedra, except it's succulent. And uh, the stems are thicker, of course. You get a really cool, uh, what's the Euphorbia in Baha? I forget, I think it's more, I forget the name of it. Lomali. Yeah, so lo, Euphorbia Lomali in Baja looks like this, except it's four feet tall and the stems are much thicker. Beautiful plant, succulent Euphorbias. Euphorbia catches a lot of flack because some of the African ones look like cacti, but they're not. Just beautiful case of convergent evolution. They got spines, but they're not leaves. They're not modified leaves. They're stipular spines. That's, South, that's in South Africa. I don't know why I'm talking about those, though. But if you want to look those up, you should because they're fucking beautiful. They get planted out in L.A. a lot. A lot of people mistake them for cacti. But this, anyway, you go, Euphorbia antisyphilitica. This is a modest specimen. I've seen them, you know, where they're 12 feet wide, growing out of a fucking rock wall. It looks like someone stuck a broom upside down on the ground. What's this over here? We got some sort of aster. Oh, that's nice. Looks like it maybe is an accordia. I don't know. I can't tell. Anyway, all right, I think I got to get going. We'll see. Huh? Hope you had a nice time. Go fuck yourself. Bye. Selaginella lepidophila, the resurrection fruit. Remember I was talking about selages and how they can go dormant and just come back to life? So this guy's brown and crispy, but he's not dead. You know, if it was going to rain, if it were to rain, he'd come right back up and he opens up just like that. You got a couple more on it, the uh, little rock wall over there. But I wanted to show you this up here. Some of the, the finest columnar jointing I've ever seen, you know? Just a beautiful red color, you know, an old volcanic plug, you know. The magma just stopped, cooled, and uh, broke up into those little hexagonal shafts that uh, seem to be numbering in the uh, hundreds of thousands and extending all the way up this, uh, again, uh, ancient volcanic plug. So this was kind of like the, uh, the smokestack of a chimney, maybe. Maybe the top of a magma chamber, you know. So it's still considered an extrusive igneous rock. It's not intrusive. I bet it's got, if I were to get up there, which I don't know if I will, I might, might decide to turn around because I'm only one armed right now. But if I were to get up there, I'd be willing to bet my ace you'd have a small grain size on those rocks. You know, I mean here, shit, this is probably the same rock type. Yeah, it looks like a relatively small grain size. So it's extrusive, but that, uh, that columnar joint thing, your devil's post, post pile or whatever the fuck it's called. One of those tourist attractions they got in Wyoming got the same thing. Always looks gorgeous whenever you see it. Hard to see that and not think, holy shit, that's beautiful. Look at all the, uh, look at all the betalane pigments and that'll punch it too. All those betalane pigments, remember, cacti being in carophyllales don't have anthocyanin pigments, which are normally the color responsible for the red coloration and, excuse me, normally, they're the pigment that's normally responsible for the red color in plants. They got the betalanes. And you got the bay lanes going off nice right there. Especially when it's uh, the cold season. They get a little chilly. That's how you can tell when a cactus is chilly. <laughs> I fucking don't know. That's not 100%. I'm just fucking around. You know, sometimes you could tell when a cactus is chilly because it's got the bay lane pigments out. Okay, so on this prickly pear species, on this little punches species, it looks like someone uh, threw their shitty teepee on it. Uh, but uh, it's not actually what's going on. It's a little bit more lighthearted than that. You can see it's actually a species of scale insect, the cochineal scale, which uh, you go down to places like Oaxaca, you know, some of the Zapotecs, they've been uh, using this to dye their uh, their world-famous uh, rugs and what the shit that they weave. They've been using this for the red pigment. Because if you crush it up, you get a real nice red pigment. You wouldn't think so because it's all white and fluffy and whatnot, but... Uh, let me see if I can pull some of this off without getting glockids or spine stuck. Yeah, there you go. See? It's nice to see. It's not shitty teepee. It's cochineal scale. You know, it, it holds the plant back a little bit, but it doesn't kill it, you know? Minor insect pest. Oh, that's nice. It's pretty nice. Look at that column. Broke off. Fell a little bit of the ways down, but not all the ways. What you think that piece weighs? Like 1,300 pounds?
Now this guy right here, this is one of my favorite species of Opuncha. This is Opuncha rufida. You might notice it doesn't got any spines. It's just got those glockets. Immensely irritating plant. Each one of those little aerials has upwards of, I don't know, maybe a hundred tiny uh, glockets. Basically the equivalent of little fiberglass hairs. You only get those glockets in the Opuntioid, that is the prickly pear subfamily of the Cactaceae, the cactus family. Okay? You touch this thing, your hands are going to, it's going to be miserable. It's a really misery, you know, huge misery inducing plant right here. But absolutely beautiful. And the only spot you get it in the United States is down by the Big Bend region of Texas. You can see it's the dominant plant here. Got a nice yuck up there. Got some guayacum, that darker bastard right there. And of course, just the, some of the most uh, fantastic uh, columnar jointing I've ever seen in an extrusive igneous rack. Just absolutely beautiful. You know, just, it's like a work of architecture. You know, you couldn't find this in the loop. If you were down on the loop, I don't care what you were doing down there, but you wouldn't find something this nice. You know, you could go to the opera house or the post office, any of those goddamn buildings, you know, but you're not going to find something ni nice like this. Man-made structures are garbage compared to this. It's, that's lovely. And again, just the, uh, you know, the, uh, the inside of an extinct volcano. Probably a volcano probably, man, I don't, know, I don't know how old this could be. Maybe 20 million years? I'm not sure about the age of the volcanism in this area. I have to check. Probably Miocene, though. Probably uh, 20 million years ago. Early Miocene. And again, you just you get that columnar joint thing because uh, when this uh, this rock cools, this extrusive igneous rock, this specific uh, chemical formula, and it cools at, the, at a certain rate, it just breaks up into these polygons. And so each one of those, basically, if you were to look at this from the top, it would just look like a, a, you know, a bunch of little polygons all smushed together. Pretty incredible. Yeah, I wonder if this is the type of uh, extrusive igneous rock that weathers to produce uh, smack tight clay in the bentonite clays or whatnot. It could be. Oh, nice Celtus up here, Hackberry. Again, Cannabaceae, same family as uh, cannabis. They yeah, said it wasn't going to come up here, but uh, yeah, it was pretty nice. It was pretty nice. So I decided to fuck with it. But you know, it's kind of uh, it's kind of it's going to be kind of sketchy going back down. Anyway, it's pretty nice. How about that, huh? I haven't looked yet. Roughly, probably, uh, it's like 20 million years old. I think that's, I think that's the date of most of the volcanism around here. Here's some birds up there. Somebody's squawking. All right, well, that's all I got for tonight. Have a lovely rest of your evening. Go fuck yourself. Bye.